Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Squared Circle podcast, where wrestling chat is for wrestling fans. My name's Andy Evans. Joining me, as always, is my broadcast partner. Uh, yeah, you are my broadcast partner, aren't you? You're my tag team partner. You're my brother from another mother. Uh, yeah, you're the, brother. You're the twisted steel to my constant sex appeal. Oh. Uh, it's Sam Mellows. Uh, how you doing, big man? Yeah, I'm doing really good. Really, really good. I had a really good week this week. Got a week off work, so who who can blame me for being happy? Um, yeah, yeah also... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, yeah, it's really, really good. Um, been a really good week in wrestling as well, so uh, what's not to like? It's been a really good week in wrestling. Really good week. Yeah. I got chat to the Virtuosa. <sighs> Very jealous. Was Great a interview, but we'll discuss that more in a bit. You did have the opportunity to attend. I will go that. Uh, we will just say that we are coming to you today from a very hot and sunny Weymouth. It's finally arrived, ladies and gentlemen. The summer has arrived here in the UK for two days because it's meant to be raining again by this weekend. No. You know. The latest update is we're, it's going to be hot until all in. We're we going to be all uh, in. And I'm going to be all out of energy come the next day when it's I'm burnt out from the heat. <laughs> I think it's going to be burning out from the shanting. Of course, that does mean that we are now two weeks away from AEW All In, which takes place Sunday, August 27th at Wembley. Uh, you can meet us at Wembley Stadium. Just come and say hello to, uh, to to Sam and myself. If you see us, we'll let you know where in the arena we're sat, what row we're in. If you come and sit next to us and you're a TSC fan, imagine that. We've got a TSC listener sat next to us at Wembley, right? That'd be cool, wouldn't it? Do you not mean uh, the whole stadium? Well, yeah. All right. Yeah. All 85,000 people. We're going to touch on that in just a second. Uh, coming up. Imagine? Oh, it would be amazing, wouldn't it? Coming up this week, uh, we've got all the normal favorites. We've got a talking point, which is all about the Heyman effect. What impact has Paul Heyman had on professional wrestling and on the WWE? We have got a clip of the Diana Parazzo interview that took place yesterday that's already available on socials and on youtube and on the podcast feed we'll give you a clip of it if you haven't seen it or you haven't listened to it check it out um and we've got your news round and we've also got rewind and i think there's a challenge i haven't written it yet uh, I forgot. So we'll be doing that in just a second. Now, if you want to get in contact with us on the show over socials, you can do. It's really easy now. Uh, and it's at the bottom of the screen if you're watching on uh, YouTube. Join in the conversation using the hashtag TSC pod. And you can go to Facebook, Instagram, X or threads. And it's TSC wrestling pod. Yeah. And also, while, while we're on that subject... Yes. On when you're on YouTube, you're watching us on YouTube. Leave us a little comment. Also, if you are not already subscribing to us, press the subscribe button. And while you're there, you change the settings on the little bell and change that to all. So anytime we put anything up, it will be automatically notify you. Also, if you're listening on Spotify, because I know you guys listen on Spotify as well, please remember to leave us a five star review. Because do you know why it helps us help you? You listeners, because trust me, we want to get as many as you guys listening on, and that helps us because we know how well we're doing. So yeah, you've had a lot of e numbers today, haven't you? Um, I may have, yeah, yeah. But blame the seat, blame the seat. A lot of e numbers. All right, this is going to be one hell of a show. Let's do it. Let's get to it. This is news round. We'll see you after this. <laughs> Smooth. I forgot the background until halfway through the video and then couldn't find it. Uh, right. As we mentioned, AEW All In is next weekend, the most historic wrestling event of all time, and it continues to make history. According to WrestleTix, the promotion has crossed 80,000 tickets sold for the event, which, as we said, takes place from the legendary Wembley Stadium in London. It has less than 1,000 tickets from breaking WrestleMania 32's record of being the highest attended wrestling event in history in paid attendance. It has already beat SummerSlam from 1992. And, you know, how historic is that? I mean, I, I was in London on Monday. I went up for work 
for the day. Uh, I got off at Waterloo Station, all in poster. Got the tube to Bakerloo, all in posters all over the place. I even sent you, you know, a picture of it in our WhatsApp. Yeah. When was the last time that you saw the UK literally be overtaken by a wrestling show? I mean, it's all over the place. Like, I know we obviously had money in the bank this year. We had Clash at the Castle last year. But for someone who goes up to London as much as I can, also goes around the country, no offence to WWE, because we could love WWE, and we'll be talking about a lot of WWE things today. However, the advertisement wasn't that much. I think when I was up there prior to uh, Money in the Bank, I saw one poster. One poster. Yeah. Compared to, I've got a lot of friends and family members who, are li- who live in London, and they see it all the time. They're like, oh, are you going to this all in? Because I know you're a wrestling fan. I know you do a wrestling podcast. You going in? I went, oh, yeah, we'll be there on the 27th doing a meet-up in, outside Wembley um, at Box Park or around that area. So um, I'm sure you'll meet us there. But, like, you see posters everywhere. And I think, for me, that's a fantastic thing that we have that way that the PR team, the, the promotions, or even the wrestlers themselves, even the wrestlers who aren't even on the show are advertising it. I've seen so many British wrestlers who aren't even on the show and not they don't, haven't even got a close friend who are on the show, but they are advertising on their socials all the time. Like, have you seen that all is in there? Like, even if all the tickets sold out, they would still promote it. And for me, that is a way forward. Like, this is historic. Like, don't get me wrong. Money in the Bank was historic and all stuff like that. Clash of Castle was historic. This is a Wembley Stadium. Wembley Stadium, 21 years, no, 31 years ago, Christ, my age. Um, um, 31 years ago, my brother and also a friend of mine who's actually going to go to All In as well, um, they went to SummerSlam 92. And hearing the stories about then, and I'm able to be in that history, and Andy and all the other 80,000 like fans in attendance, we're going to be their part of history. Like, this is massive. And this, I think, for me... No offence to Money in the Bank, but this is a proving point that we can have wrestling. Big wrestling companies come to this country all the time. Like, we have Impact coming later this year. And obviously, we talk with Andy talks about it more in the interview. The, the fact that we had Money in the Bank, we had Clash of the Castle last year. Hopefully, it's going to become a recurring, recurring thing. It's going to be constant. I don't think, because I truly believe, that the 27th of August is going to go down in history of reigniting American and also um, Japanese or companies around the world going, do you know what? We should do a show in England. Why? Because we are the heart of wrestling. I've always said this since I was an EO to a grasshopper. English wrestling is where it comes from. Like, oh, and it, like the, we have wrestling. The Americans have wrestling. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm pumped for it, as you can probably tell. And it's not just today's E numbers. <laughs> But I think we're already seeing that, though, aren't we? Because already, since All In got announced, you know, we've had the Money in the Bank pay-per-view, which you you quite rightly mentioned. We've had that John Cena tease of WrestleMania coming to the UK. Um, We've had New Japan announce they're coming back. They're going to be at the Copper Box. Impact are now doing four dates here in the UK. And it's all taking place in one calendar year. But it... I I suppose my only question is, and we'll talk more on this, I'm sure, next week when we do the preview for All In. Is it too much? Because you're going from, you're shaking your head, and I I get it, and I'm a wrestling fan as well, and and I'm with you, I'm more the merrier. We don't get Raws, we don't get Smackdowns. But the reason I'm going here is, we are obviously still in the cost of living crisis. Okay, if you want to go political, we're in a cost of living crisis, the war in Ukraine, inflation rates have gone up through the roof, cost of spending has gone up through the roof. You saw money in the bank tickets going for up to two and a half thousand pounds. You've then got the impact tickets, which trust me, I want to go to that show because it's going to be amazing. Those one of those four shows. New Japan are coming over. All in have come over. If you do this on a recurring basis every year. How do you pick and choose which one you want to go to? And is it too much? Because you've got to think, AEW next year, based on the success of this, are going to be running all in again. That will expand to become a dynamite. That will expand to become a collision. That will expand to become a rampage. So already you're getting a full weekend. A full week. A full week. WWE WWE have already done Raw, SmackDown, and a pay-per-view. Impact yeah. would make sense for Impact to do an Impact 
month of tapings in the UK because we know they're pre-taped, followed it up by the UK tour. So where does it where does it stop? And how often do you get a company like WWE or AEW coming to the UK to do yeah, this? Yeah, so, so it's an interesting question because I, I had the same discussion with one of my mates and we were discussing about the price of it because I so wanted to go to Clash the Castle. I so wanted to go to Money in the Bank. However, a certain company that is very famous for selling tickets put the tickets very, very, very high. And it's been very noted that it was that company, not the actual company that had the wrestling show, um, itself, because the wrestling show itself didn't want the tickets to be that high, but the com- the ticket company did. I'm not saying say, saying names because there's many companies that can sell tickets. Very masters at it. Um, like you know, but the anyone thing for me, any, anyone would think they are ticket masters. Masters, yes. Um, no, because also the, 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 it's funny because they're the same company who then sell tickets for All In. Completely, completely different price dynamics. And you say about the whole cost of living and that lot. And I think, I always say cluster flush. But I do believe that I think all the companies, I'm not saying they all sit together in a boardroom and go, right, you guys take spring, you take you take um, <laughs> summer, you take fall and you take winter. But I think you should realise that why would you do a show literally the month after? It has worked this time, but in the future, I think if it was well spread, they could make big things of it, all stuff like that. But in this day and age, I almost feel like with the cost of living, post-COVID and all that things, and I've always said this and I say this to my mate, is that in my view, we need that something to look forward to, just not all at once. Hence why I think it should be that the company should realise, ah, okay, so this company's doing it then, we're doing it then. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but it's being well-spread, well-marketing, like... No one's going to want to go on Monday to something, and then oh, you're going to go to this pretty much the same thing on Tuesday. You're going to get you're going to get burnt out. You're not going to be able to afford both days, or you're not going to be able to get both days off, or stuff like that. Like we're in a day and age that so many companies now you have to take annual leave, and you have to take, or if you're not, you have to take days off. It's not easy to just click your fingers and get that day off, or planning around. And I think in a day and age where we are tight on money. Well, right, don't, don't get me wrong, we all know this, but we should have something to look forward to. Like some people look forward to Taylor Swift coming to sing or Harry Styles or Adele. Like people look forward to that thing. For me, I yes, don't get me wrong, did go and see Ed and Sheeran last year, absolutely loved it. But I'm a Ed I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Ed Sheeran fan, I fully admit. Um, but my biggest thing is the fact I've really, really looked forward to and you could my, probably bored my wife to death about it. But the 27th of August, I'm so buzzing to go. Not just because it's wrestling, but because it's a day out with friends and having making history. But the biggest part is I'm a massive wrestling fan and wrestling is coming back to the England. And it's at a fair price. The fact that you're able to get our tickets for 30, like no more than £30 per mm. person. Yes, they are up in the gods. And if you want to go lower, they are more. But that's like anything. The thing I didn't accept was the fact that with Money in the Bank and Clash of the Castle, you were up in the gods in the nosebleeds and you it, basically you, you probably were watching Ant-Man in the ring as a, as a little dot. But the tickets were about five times more than the ticket I, I'm, I'm having for Wembley. And it's quite mind-blowing that different companies can do that or the, the certain masters of tickets can put the tickets at different things. So, yeah. You've made some really interesting points there. And I want to kind of like pick up on a couple of them if I can um and the first one is is the fact that you mentioned about not running another major promotion event one month after the other and you're right money in the bank was July all in is obviously August do you know why I think it's worked and it's worked for two reasons one they are both premium a star events right Mm -hmm. it's not like AEW have come over and just running a house show which yeah okay admittedly three weeks ago we were all concerned it was going to be a house show because no matches have been booked you know it's the it's a historic moment for all elite not only because of the fact it's their first tour in the UK since inception bear in mind we've been through the pandemic era um but it's Wembley Stadium you know And if you're watching this on YouTube, guys, we are having, I think, some internet issues. So you might be watching the video. It might be a little bit out of sync. Um, Hopefully the audio is not affected. 
we can't do much about that. It's the evil empire called Sky Fiber. But just bear with us on it as much as we can. Um, but I think, you know, it's it's interesting how they've placed it. And I think it's a great testament to UK fans because we are so passionate about professional wrestling. And we have lost a lot of time compared to the US. Oh, yes. But it's, there's also a point where... I would love to have had that scenario in my head going around and what you were saying about all the companies sat in the boardroom, like talking about when they were going to come to the UK. I would love to have Triple H sending a text going, hello, secondary promotion, AEW. Uh, we, we were, and Tony Khan coming back saying, we're bigger than you. So we're going for, you can just imagine that I'd yeah. love to animate it and just imagine those conversations. Oh, but anyway, there but we that, go. But the last thing about it is the fact that one thing I will say, and I've, I've said I've heard this from so many people who are who went to Money in the Bank, but who are also going to All In, that they feel like they feel like it's different. They're because they're two different companies. They're going to be doing two different products. That's why it's worked being back to back. If it was it was just a bog standard, not no offense to things, but a bog standard pay per view, may have not worked. But because it was yeah. a, a gimmick a gimmick pay per view in the form of or premium live event in the form of money in the bank it helped so yeah but also i think the fact that what was i going to say it's history isn't it you got yeah. there's a lot of legacy coming here because you're going to have a lot of parents who were kids at SummerSlam 92 oh, yeah. that came with their parents are now bringing their kids and i know that for a fact because one of my closest friends is doing the same thing you know he's bringing his son he went with his dad back in 1992 yeah. He's now going with his son in 2023. And that's what it's all about, isn't it? You know, yeah, you compared to, I, I, know, I know someone who went with, and this is brilliant, the, he went with his dad yeah. and his granddad yeah. at All In. He's going with his granddad in a, in a wheelchair. Him, his, uh, so it's him, his granddad, his dad, and his son. So wow. it's literally, it went from three generations to now four generations, 30 years on. So his son is five and probably won't really enjoy the show because he'll be like, oh my God, but who knows? <laughs> We're in the headphones, but it's still, it's going to be amazing. And next week we will be previewing the card as we know it at the time of recording and i'm still expecting some big ones obviously i think tomorrow night uh tonight as we're recording this on wednesday uh on dynamite we know kenny omega's got a sit down interview with jim ross i am expecting that match to be confirmed uh then jericho we know is over with fozzy he's gonna be on that card and do you know what i'm predicting for this i've got it I, i've got an idea of what's going to happen Okay. I reckon I've got two scenarios based on tonight's dynamite. We know Jericho is going to go to the Callis family and give his decision. Okay. They are not going to do Kenny Omega versus uh, Takashita at all in. They're going to wait until it all out. Jericho is going to decline the Callis family. He will be facing Takashita at all in. Ooh. Bet you. I've got a different theory. We know the Will Offspray is at, yeah. at All In. Realistically, Chris Jericho's at All In. Realistically, Kenny Omega is All In. Triple threat match. Kenny Omega versus Y2J versus the Aerial Assassin. I'm sorry, but that is money. Hang on, hang on. Will Ospreay versus Y2J versus the Aerial Assassin. Will no. Ospreay can't wrestle himself twice. That's what you just said. Did I say that? Okay. So <laughs> the cleaner versus Y2J versus the aerial assassin. I'm getting too excited. What did I say about the E numbers? <laughs> I did tell you when you came on board, I will pick you up on the smallest of little things. Because if I don't, somebody will. Uh, that's a good match. The other perspective, and this is uh, actually thanks to Lee, who put a comment on Facebook earlier on today. We know the night before, um, all in is uh, I think it's Ref Pro doing something at the cockpit. We also know that Mickey James is over for that. So where Mickey James goes, a certain husband will most likely follow. And I want to take you back in time to 2018 of All In in Chicago, where it was 
Cody Rhodes, the EVP, facing off against Nick Aldis. Mm-hmm. Cody Rhodes is no longer in the w- in the WWE. He's no longer in AEW. But another EVP is Kenny Omega. So Kenny Omega, Nick Aldis, to see if Aldis can beat two of the EVPs of All Elite. Okay. That could Just be put another one out or, for you. Okay, hang on two seconds. I've got, okay. I've got one more. I've got two more. Or Kenny Omega versus Will Ospreay 3, which I hope doesn't happen, but I do hope it happens because that will be a god. And Chris Jericho joins the Callis family and goes up against Sammy Guevara. Very nice, very nice. I like that. There's another one. And this is what I've seen a lot online people are saying. The night before, you have Red Pro's 11th anniversary, but yep. also you have Progress. Yep. And a certain, certain Davy Boy Smith Jr. is on that card. Oh, dear. Mickey James is at Red Pro. So Nick Aldis goes with. And a lot of people are saying, are they going to put on a British exhibition match between Davy Boy Smith Jr.? And Nick Aldis. I hope not, because I believe Nick Aldis is signed with WWE as a producer. We don't know how much that is true. And I feel like David Boy Smith Jr. isn't isn't quite into the standard of being an exhibition match wrestler for All In when there's other matches that should be on that card. But who knows? But we will discuss that more next week on next week's show, because next week's show we're going to be All In, talking about All In. But also, when we're on about that, we're also going to be talking about a new segment that will happen at All In. Oh, I forgot about this. Yeah. All right. But I'm going to keep that to leave to you guys to be excited and look forward to finding out what more about that is next week. Yeah. And and I totally totally forgot about that. Also, um, we haven't even got to this week's show. Next week for the All In, we are hopefully going to have a guest uh, joining us to become a three-man band who will be at All In as well so we'll be doing the all-in preview right coming up next cm punk we're sticking with all elite wrestling and we're sticking with yeah this past weekend it was reported that aw star adam hangman page was in greensboro on saturday to film a pre-tape for tonight's dynamite however when the former world champion arrived at collision he was told they had to film the segment elsewhere page wasn't the only talent who was sent away According to Fightful Select, Ryan Nemeth, the brother of Nick Nemeth of Dolph Ziggler, uh, was sent home. Christopher Daniels was sent home. Why were they sent home? Because they had previous beef with CM Punk. Now, CM Punk is calling the shots on collision. You've got to think. At the end of the six-man match, the trios match for the trio championship between CMFTR and the House of Black, Punk cut a promo on Adam Page, basically saying he couldn't draw, he was worthless, etc., etc., etc. It went all around the the buzz, the the internet dirt sheets, about whether or not that was a work shoot, whether or not it was legit, whether or not it was scripted. Apparently, it was a work shoot. He's actually gone and apologised to Adam Page for the way it came out. We also know that the Young Bucks, nah, they're not going to work a program with CM Punk. Kenny Omega is open to working this program, but we don't know about Adam Page. So the question is, is CM Punk doing the right thing the way he's acting on Collision? Because whether or not we've got a brand split, we seem to have a brand split. So I, I personally would agree that he is doing the right thing. Um, but that's probably the bit of heel in me. Um, but no, I, <laughs> I, th- I think the thing is, the thing for me with it all is he's obviously doing something right. Because look at Collision. It's the best show out of the three. Like, I've, I will fully admit I wasn't a fan of Collision, be- the idea of Collision before it. And I was like, this ain't, why do we need a third one? Yeah. But it works so well. Yeah. And he's obviously doing something right. Kicking some people out of backstage because of being previous beef with them? Don't know how I feel about that. 
not saying it's professional and the whole uh, I've, I've seen videos of said like promo yeah. and there is bits you think to yourself dude wind your neck in you're doing an absolutely amazing job but wind your neck in i'm i'm left feeling you're clearly doing the right thing because it's working and look at the, the ratings looking at the viewing also looking at your product if you are the one in charge and the one who's booking everything Fair play for Tony Khan for giving him that opportunity and he is taking it and running. He has proven how well he thinks about wrestling and he's not just a, I'm a wrestler, it's all about me thing. However, he is all about him. It is the CM Punk show or no show. And I feel to the point where is it going to get to the point that there's another kickoff and we're not going to have collision because who's going to book it? Or are we going to have collision and it's going to go downhill? I I hope it doesn't get to the point where he's then going to start burning bridges that are never going to be able to be built again. And we're going to have a point where people are going to want to leave AEW like we had to Joey Janela, we had to Sonny Kiss, we had other wrestlers who have chosen to go, do you know what? No, I'm off. Bye. I'm, that, that's the door. I'm going to walk out of it. I'm not going to re-sign. Or we have other people who go, well, actually, I really want to re-sign. And those people are re-signing because of Punk. Or they, they're signing because they now have a third uh, third show. So that means more people are being featured. It's not the same people all three shows. Is that the CM Punk effect or is that the Tony Khan effect? I, see, I would argue and say it's a bit of both. Okay. Mm. Now, the only thing that I'm concerned about is we covered the other week on the show about Britt Baker coming out saying but there isn't a brand split as far as we know, but it's a great opportunity to be on a different TV. The thing about Collision at the moment, which I like, is it is separate. And I do like that. I I will say this. The set is amazing. It's one of the most beautiful sets on TV at the moment. Um, And I like the old school feel of it. The Saturday night's main event kickoff with the, the cold open. And then you go in with the promos and then you go in with everything else. And I like the fact that they're building Ricky Starks and they're giving him a platform and they're, and they're really making a mainstay. But I think what's going to hurt Collision at some point down the line is you're going to get bored of CM Punk. Yeah. What happens as we have known CM Punk do over the last couple of years, he gets injured. You, you then starting to bring the elite or the BCC onto collision. How does it then feel different to dynamite? And I suppose what I'm trying to get at here is, are they trying to put all their eggs in one basket, making it the CM Punk show and giving him this creative reign, burning bridges, not letting some of the audience who don't watch Dynamite just watch Collision miss out on people like Wheeler Utah, miss out on the Jericho Appreciation Society. That whole storyline is exclusive to Dynamite. You're not seeing yeah. any of it on Collision. So but, it, is but, like we've gone, we, it is like we've got a hard hmm. brand slit, but if you get injured, who's going to pick it up and run with it? Absolutely. And that, that's the thing, like, I feel if you had an exact brand split and you know the brand members and let's say, for instance, Collision, it's CM Punk, FTR, The House of Black, um, and then a few others. And the fact of the metal oh, Samoa Joe. So then CM Punk gets injured. OK, who's really literally going to be the main event or main event story? It's going to be Joe versus Ricky Starks. Or is it going to be Malachi Black versus Samoa Joe? Or is it... Um, FTR, we're going to focus on the tag team and have FDR versus Brody King and uh, Buddy Matthews, or whatever his, his, his ring name is these days. <laughs> I know he's track. All I know is he's uh, Rhea Ripley's hus- uh, fiance, soon to be husband. Um, but the thing for me, I, I truly believe, is that if they do a proper brand split, I think it's going to be better for the products, all three products, because then here's those people, here's those people, and here's those people. And like you say about the exclusive stories, however, you then have the issue, and not just down to injury, but down to quite a lot of the AEW roster are not fixed with just AEW. They can wrestle for Ring of Honor. They can wrestle for Rev Pro. They can wrestle for Progress. They can wrestle for MLW. They can wrestle for World Wrestling down in Australia. Like World Series, World Series, Series Wrestling is... All these different companies that are they're allowed to wrestle for, well, they may have other bookings. So it means there's that that difficulty. 
and that's the situation where a brand split is not a good thing because they can bounce between and be very fluid with what they're what when they're on that they can be up Wednesday they can be on dynamite and they can also be on collision on Friday a uh, Saturday I mean but then the next week they're not on it at all because they like like Chris um, Jericho with Fozzie he can go off to Germany and um, perform free shows and then he'll be back ready for the following weeks. But you, you, you say that, the contract stipulations. I mean, we don't know the All Elite contracts. We're not going to see one, are we? We haven't seen it. Um, but the, the the All Elite contracts, I would imagine, would be very much similar to the old Impact Wrestling TNA. <clears throat> Excuse me, where it is, you can go work for these other independent companies, but we're priority. So if we say to you, we need you for, t- for TV, yeah. you're pulled. And they've done that, and they've gone yeah. to, to those shows. But I also think, and this is where I think TNA got it right, back in the day the fact that if you open it up and you allow them to go to gcw like i I think this past week there was either a gcw or an mlw card where every match had somebody from all elite yeah on it right now two hours of dynamite two hours of collision one hour rampage eight hours of pay-per-view this month if we work on the basis of four hours for all in and four hours for all out you are now risking your talent injury by allowing them to go out and do the independent scene on the level that they're working. So if you are going to be running these two A star programs, Ramp- um, Dynamite and Collision, and you are going to do this brand split and you are going to bring in the house shows, which we know Jeff Jarrett's been signed on for, you're going to pull them from the live events, right? Yeah. And so- Put that brand split in place now so people know what rosters you're going to go and watch. Because oh, it absolutely. Will, but do it properly. Don't do it like WWE where you do the draft and then you've got LA Knight suddenly appearing on Monday Night Raw. And now you know The Miz is going to appear on SmackDown this, this week, right? Cut it. Ricky Starks is Collision. John Moxley is Dynamite. We're not going to see him cross over. The only way we will see them cross over are the champions. Yeah. You get then, rid of this whole, t- yeah, but you also get rid of this whole TNT title and TBS title. You have yeah. one mid card, one women's, and they can go on both brands. Yeah, and then so I saw online someone say that like because of how if they did a brand split, they need to do it a certain way. If you're going to have a fluid, uh, let's call it the fluid thing, where they can be on different things, is have Rampage, have that yes. Friday night show. Is yes. to have the one that they can bit like you have the nowadays you have main event you have all that sort of stuff or back in the day you had heat or velocity that you have it that Wednesday it's Wednesday night dynamite and Saturday night collision like you have Monday night Raw and Friday night SmackDown you have two separate brands but then on Friday you have Rampage where everyone can go that is the dumping ground not dumping ground that's word, that's wrong wording but like almost. That is the middle ground between the two, and they can amalgamate and meet there and fight the, all their woes out there, or to the point where that's where they build up to when you go to pay per views. Go back to the old school way of having it like it's Monday Raw, uh, it's Monday Night Raw versus Friday Night SmackDown in the match because they're going to send their best and their best, and then it could be done on uh, on Rampage. But, but also it will give Rampage an identity because it will be, this is the development. You don't know what is going to happen on Rampage, right? Mm-hmm. Let's be frank. The best episode of Rampage in recent memory was a championship Friday where you yeah. had AAA, you had Zack Sabre Jr. Nobody knew what it was going to be, but it was good. And actually I will say Rampage has had a rub thanks to Collision coming in because they seem to be booking it, it better. But I like that idea where you've suddenly yeah. got you know, you're doing three matches on the card for Rampage, and all of a sudden, Brian Danielson appears, cutting a promo on Myro. Right? That's going to lead to a. Pe- I'm, I'm using it as an example. That's yeah, no, 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 no. That'll be a killer of match. Yeah, but that's going to lead to double or nothing, right? Or you've got fight for the fallen. Over those three nights, you could amalgamate the brands, but because of this, and I think part of it is the CM Punk thing and the elite this this whole backstage controversy that they've kind of created it and they're not innocent in this the young bucks are not innocent in this right because the young bucks should be on collision they should be on next saturday night's collision absolutely 
promoting the match with FTR. Yeah. Right. And, now, they might be, and they might be. Oh, yeah. But there won't be any CM Punk anywhere near them. But they, you've got to also, like, we were saying the fact that, obviously, we don't know what Adam Page situation with CM Punk is. But no. the no. fact that Omega has said, okay, I'm up for working. I don't, we don't know, obviously, how much so far, but up for working a program with Punk. And the fact that Ham, Adam Page might be the same. We don't know. However, the fact that the Bucks have clearly said, no, we don't want to be anywhere, anywhere near Phil, like keep Phil Brooks away from us. Like you think to yourself, you're shooting yourself in the foot. But then it leads on to the factor of when you look at the factor of how you've got people like FDR, you've got people like House of Black, who those two teams alone against Young Bucks is pure money and also amazing matches. Yeah. Like, you're shooting yourself in the foot because I'm not saying they don't have... This, but at the moment, there isn't overly loads of tag teams in AEW. So who are they going to face? BC, BCC or BCG? Um, <laughs> but it's true. Um, like, but it got gold. It's, you, you open yourself to go... Who are you going to actually face? And that's where it would work if you had two separate brands who have these are the tag teams and have it that let's see, for instance, Collision has the trios title and then Dynamite has the tag title. The It, it would work like that. But the problem is at the moment it's not working like that. No, and I, and I think that's the thing. Tony Khan is, is trying to keep it as fluid as he can. I mean, I'm still surprised going back to the all in card, how we still don't know the Samoa Joe CM Punk challenge. See, is that going to take place at all in? They're promoting it, but they're also promoting Darby Allen versus Luchasaurus at all out. Yeah. And we know Darby Allen's in the tag match with Sting. So are we getting that match at all in? Are we not getting CM Punk at all in? Now, if you don't bring CM Punk to all in, you are going to have 80,000 plus fans in Wembley pissed. Oh, because he'll be there, you and it may just be a promo. Well, that's a waste of bringing CM Punk over. You want CM exactly. Punk in the match. It's history again. It's his first match in the UK since WWE. And also the fact that he was the first person to and um, like literally verbalise All In on AEW programming. But it's, then there's, a, there's the other side of it. It's just all together, all in, and we'll discuss this more next week. I really don't want to overpower this week's show no, on all in no. because also we're talking about uh, we're talking about Paul Heyman, also, also talking about Deanna, to, um, Deanna in a minute. But the the thing for me as well is the fact that when you look at it, we are a week and a half away from the show, and at the moment we know there's one show on zero hour, but not loads of matches. There's like one match on zero hour, and there's some matches on the main card. But you think to yourself, but there's not enough matches on the main card to make you feel like we need a zero hour. That match on zero hour is going to lead into something on the main card. Oh, absolutely. And it's going to... And, it, and, and it will be the bust up between Adam Cole and, and MJF. But I also think that is going to set Will Ospreay up. Because Aussie Open yeah. and Will Ospreay are, are, are obviously together in New Japan, aren't they? That used to be the stable. And, and there's also a lot of talk that everyone in that stable is going to be at Wembley, especially as you've got certain members of that roster, uh, certain members of that stable are British based. Yes. Um, Lord Gideon Gray, big shout out. I, I, I've, not, I've met him quite a few times in the past, but he's part of that faction. He's a Rev Pro guy. Like he is very British based. Even uh, the Aussie Open, they are Australian, but they've spent so much time in England with Rev Pro, with Progress. Like. And that's the thing, like, it, they are very cleverly doing this. That they're going, we know you're going to want to see them. And doing it that it's on zero hour, and now the fact that the opening of the doors is earlier, and that match is going to be on earlier than what originally it was all, like, thing for, that is clever, because no one's going to want to miss that match. No. So they're going to get into their bums onto their seats much earlier. They're going to be ready at those gates at 3.30. But what are they going to do to keep those fans engaged? in zero hour because that match, I mean, yeah, again, we'll talk about it next week, but that match isn't going to go more than 10, 15 minutes because you're not going to want to burn out MJF and Adam Cole. Fozzie right? performing live oh, at Wembley. 
No, 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 no. Jericho's most likely booked that. That's going to be the interval halfway through the pay-per-view. Yeah. Card. <laughs> and then Jericho will suddenly come on stage saying, I can't perform tonight. We're going to do a talking spit. Anyway, um, yeah. one person who might, though, be returning to the ring at All In, potentially, is former ROH World Champion Nigel McGuinness. A new report from Fightful Select notes that McGuinness has been taking measures to try to return to the ring. It's not been confirmed he's been medically cleared, but he has taken steps. Now, it was noted that his name was brought up in recent months as a possible competitor at All In. That would make sense. However, it could not be confirmed there are plans in order for McGuinness to wrestle or that it's been broached internally by AEW. Back in McGuinness, uh, back in April, McGuinness spoke about a ring return and would not rule out working the big show uh, all in, not the big show, Paul White, at Wembley on August 27th. There was speculation at it. It could be Captain Insano. Uh, there was speculation on McGuinness and Danielson. Obviously, that's out of the order because Danielson's got the broken arm. I, I will say I've missed Danielson not being on TV recently. We'll touch on that again later. Um, it could be McGuinness versus Samoa Joe would be a, a good rehash of that, of the rivalry. Who knows? But it has been many years now since uh, he competed in the ring. In fact, the last time uh, he wrestled was on 2010. That is a... That is, like, I, I can't wait. I, I, I just, for me, I'm a massive fan of him anyway. I was a massive fan of when he was in ROH. I've, I've seen him in person in this country. Um, not from actually met him, but I've been at the back of a a Wembley, uh, a Wembley, a wrestling hall, should I say? Um, no, not in the back of Wembley. The back of a, a wrestling hall, watching him in the ring. He wasn't um, actually wrestling, but he was doing an in-ring promo, ready for the next show. Um, but that was back when he was actually wrestling. And like all reports, is that he is such a nice guy, like literally such a nice guy. And he deserves to have another crack of the whip on in the ring, even if it is maybe for one or two matches. But the fact that is. If he is ring fit and ring clear for the 27th, even if it is, let's say, for instance, they chuck in a casino, uh, was it a casino, casino royale? royale battle royal, yeah. royal battle royal, even if he was just in there for a few moments just to get that massive pop for the um, for the British crowd, I'd love it. Even if it's he, I hope he doesn't do the whole classic from the commentary booth. No, 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 no. But if not, I'd lo I would love to see him. Obviously, we won't see him personally and hear him, but when we watch it back, we will be able to. But to have him on the commentary in England would be beautiful. I, do, I wonder if that will be it. But I do, I do expect Jim Ross to kind of do his last call at, at uh, All In, all, all Out, but we'll talk on that next week. Um, one thing I do want to touch on is, I'm going to name drop, I interviewed Nigel McGuinness in person, face-to-face. -face. Yes, um, I know, I know. In, Oh, at Wembley, at Wembley Arena, at yeah, no. Wembley Arena, uh, when he was Desmond Wolf in TNA. And what I can tell you is he is a genuinely nice chap. In fact, I think I've got a photo where Lee and I were stood next to AJ Styles and Desmond Wolf, you know, back back in the day, you know. That'd be hard. I don't want to rub Very it jealous. in. don't want to rub it in too much, but, you know. It was a long time ago. Uh, all right. That, he's looking at me going, I'm going to kill you. That's it for the news Very round. Jealous. <laughs> let's, um, let's do something a bit different. Because as we've been talking about over the, well, all the way through the show, Impact Wrestling are coming back to the UK in October to do the maximum, well, you want to call it the Maximum Impact Tour, but it's not. It's the UK Invasion Tour. October 26th, 27th, 28th, and 29th. 26th, they're in Glasgow. 27th, they're in Newcastle. And the 28th and the 29th, they are in Coventry at the HMV Empire. October 29th, tickets went on sale this morning as we're recording this on the 16th of August at 9 a.m. You can get them at impact impact at impactwrestling.com forward slash events. Yesterday, I had the pleasure of sitting down one on one with the virtuoso Diana Peraza. The interview, because of our agreement with Impact, was released yesterday, and you can check it out on the podcast feed and on the YouTube channel. It went for around 15 minutes, Sam, and I just want to say I think 
Diana was such a lovely woman to sit and chat to. And if anyone's expecting us to sit and talk about impact, we didn't. We talked about Steve, uh, Steve Macklin. We've talked about her journey about rebuilding herself. Yeah. Uh, and, and her mental health and her mental well-being. Um, we've touched on Jordan Grace. We touched on what it was like for her and Steve to win the Impact and the World title on the same night at the same time. We've also talked about how one of the two is a major Marvel fan. Yeah. yeah. So what we're going to do is Very we're cool. going to play a clip from this interview uh, now it is available as i said on the youtube channel and on the podcast feed if you haven't listened to it already check it out um this is my catch-up well at least a couple of minutes of it with diana perrazzo uh recorded yesterday we'll see you after this <laughs> All right, welcome back to the Squared Circle Podcast. Andy here. Joining me now is a former multi-time Impact Knockouts champion. She's a former Impact Women's Tag Champion, AAA Reina de Arenas champion as well. Arguably the greatest female professional wrestler of all time and a Captain America fan. I'm loving this. It's the virtuosa <laughs> Diana Perazzo. Diana, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm very good. We won't tell anybody that's the second time we tried to do that intro. <laughs> Your secret uh, is safe brilliant and and of course now it's not uh <laughs> big news coming out of course impact is coming back to the uk in october for the uk tour how exciting is it for you to be coming to these shores nearly eight years after the last time i'm so excited uh, the last the last few years it's always been asked like what else do you want impact to do and for me it was always go back to the uk um, the, you know, all the, the people who have been before and done these UK tours talk about the amazing time they had together, the fan base, how insanely supportive they are of Impact Wrestling. And I've seen a glimpse of that the last, you know, three plus years that I've been here at Impact. But um, I'm excited to get back. It's been a long time since I've personally been in the UK or wrestled in the UK. So I'm excited to do that again. But to do it with Impact makes it that much better. I can honestly say that I went to every UK tour uh, the impact ran prior to them taking their hiatus and they were the best live wrestling shows that I've been to. So the, the anticipation for you coming back to the UK is really high. I can't wait to do it. But the big news coming out is that there's an extra date going on sale August 16th at 9am in Coventry mm -hmm. on October 29th. Again, the impact, pardon the pun, for UK fans to get an extra date must be really heartwarming for you guys uh, over there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and just to know that, again, they're that supportive, they're that invested in, in seeing impact. Um, and they weren't just excited about three days, they forced us into a fourth. Um, feels amazing. And I think that it's just like that one more step of a warm welcome of like, we can't wait to have you here. And this is off the he heels of an amazing Australia tour that we just did. Um, and, you know, so I think it's going to be that much better. I think that there's, you know, more of our roster coming with us. There's extra dates. Um, and I'm just excited to be able to do it with some of my greatest friends. What do you think you're going to be doing? Are you going to be going for the knockout championship Ooh. against Trinity, uh, Naomi Trinity? And if you want to find out what she said about that, then you need to check out the full interview with Diana Perrazzo. Uh, massive thanks to Impact Wrestling for uh, giving us the opportunity to speak to Diana. Sam, you, you've watched the interview i mean how pumped are you for the impact tours i was i was so pumped i really hope i can go um uh, i'm sure that when we talk about a certain new segment next week uh we will discuss that more as well um i might even talk about it on this show because it really pumps it up but no the, i think for me the fact that it's coming back is fantastic because many moons ago when they were last in this country i couldn't go because of um ill health and i really wanted to and i was gutted never been to a live impact show um and it's it's one thing that's on my bucket list because i really really want to go see them live i love them I've, I, I've said it before when i've surprised you and our previous co-host um that when we discussed about what was the best wrestling show of the week i said impact and it's because the thing with the impact is they're different they are the misfits i i I've call them but they're not the misfits in the fact of they're not great wrestlers they're amazing wrestlers but this show is different from your WWE. It's different from your AEW. 
he's so good. And they are progressing back. I, if COVID wasn't a thing, I, I think they would have already been back on the English shore so much sooner. But because of COVID, they they were they were the most affected company in in a way, and I and t- fully understandable why they're affected. But the fact they're coming back, and we're going to get to see such amazing wrestlers, such amazing performers, such amazing talent back on our fair shores. I'm pumped for it, and the fact that we have WWE, AEW, and then TNA Impact in one year in this country, amazing. I, I'm just, I am so pumped. And it's not the E numbers. I'd be like this if I had zero energy. I can't wait for them to come. Trust me, I can't wait. I can't remember a show where I've been able not to get a word in edgeways. I mean, I try and say something and you just carry on. Um, I, so am I. I mean, I went, as I said in the interview there, I went, I've been to all of the Maximum Impact tours when they were running. Uh, Bournemouth, London, whatever. They were tremendous. And there was something about being at an impact show, walking around the atrium in the O2 arena. Um, and all of a sudden Dixie appeared, right? Walking through the people or yeah. just in the crowd and Dixie's there. And, you know, you get a photo with Dixie, you have a chat with Dixie. The last one we went to um, was when I was doing the total wrestling show. And I got, we went up to do the tour and um, got invited backstage and interviewed Serge Salinas, who is Dixie's husband, and was also the main composer for a lot of the music. And you're in this room, and there's Dixie Carter sat there, there's Serge sat there, and you're having a chat. And then they go, do you want to walk into the backstage? And we walk into the backstage area and go around the where the ring is, and you've got all the impact talent there. It, oh. You know, it was it moments like that you don't get with WWE. It's the fact well, I've heard that story before from you, and I still get goosebumps hearing it. Love it. I know. It's brilliant. I love those moments. You don't get that with WWE, and that's Impact, because Impact are for the fans. They're for the people, and they always have been. And and that's why I love Impact so much. Tickets are available now, impactwrestling.com forward slash events. Um, check out the full interview with Deanna Perrazzo. Uh, I, I've done this for a number of years now, if you haven't guessed, and she was one of my favorite interviews to do it's she's fantastic. absolutely brilliant all right coming up next we're going to go to rewind let's look back at what happened this week in wrestling history we'll see you after this <laughs> All right, so this week in wrestling history, we're going to look at three key moments, and you can see them if you're watching on YouTube on screen right now. The first one took place uh, in 2010. It was August the 15th, and it was SummerSlam 2010. Um, The show mostly focused on John Cena and his battle with the WWE locker room against the first season of the NXT rookies led by Wade Barrett. Of course, that was the Nexus. it was the match ended with the Nexus defeated by Team Cena. It also featured the likes of WWE Hall of Famer, the Hitman Bret Hart, Hall of Famer Edge, and someone who should be a Hall of Famer, Chris Jericho, plus a returning Daniel Bryan. In other matches, uh, Sheamus defended the WWF champion, WWE Championship against Randy Orton. Sam, what's your? What, do you remember SummerSlam 2010, the whole Nexus storyline with like Wade Barrett and all that type of thing? So... Tell you a little story about this, so I'm going to carry my breath back. So, me, my brother, and a few of our friends used to do a thing called the pay-per-view crew. We used to sit down, and we used to watch it every month, every pay-per-view. And I remember saying to everyone who that, that mystery partner was. Now, I like, know it's not, they know it's not. I said, trust me, on our prediction league, trust me, I can tell you it's going to be Brian Daniels or Daniel Bryan. It's going to be him. No, it's not. It's not. It's going to be. It's going to be the Miz. It's going to be this person. It's going to be that person. I said, trust me, it's going to be him. They were like, but why? I said, it works. Think of the storyline. Trust me, you're going to have that moment. We're going to think it's Miz. Miz is going to stand there. Boom. Walk past. Was I right? Yes, I was. I knew it because the sheer factor of how they did the storyline. The whole. Him being fired because he strangled um, Justin Roberts with a tie or stuff like that. No, that's gobbledygook. It meant he got to give some time to rest because he was with an injury from the NXT like shows. Oh, I thought the whole match was amazing. And the fact of the two teams, 
I'm a massive Nexus fan. I'm also a massive like that's a fan. So yeah. Have you got your breath back now? Yeah, I have. <laughs> You're, are you sure? You sure? Yeah. That was funny. Um, do you know what? I think it was very clever booking by WWE because apparently he was legitimately released from the contract, from what everybody knows, right? But yeah, legitimately with the inverted commas. But it was really clever booking because of the fact that he went to the independent shows. Yeah. But if you remember right, he went to the ones that were affiliated with WWE. Yeah. Oh, interesting, Matt. Yeah, very funny. But it was a great match. And it was also good seeing the hitman Bret Hart. Although, I don't know about you, but I really miss seeing Bret like, in the pink and black. It just wasn't the same seeing him with like, combat chings in a Hart Foundation t-shirt. You know. Yeah. All right, next up. We won't talk about him. <laughs> August the 16th, 2001, WWE presented the first ever live edition of SmackDown airing on UPN. The show was notable for two things. The debut of the Fist set, which was the, I think, the most iconic SmackDown, fist, uh, Smackdown set in history. And the use of the beautiful people by Marilyn Manson as the theme song. I mean, you can see it up on screen now. That was such a cool set, wasn't it? Seeing that fist on the entranceway, like punching through the wall. It was, for me, it, It's there's no other better set. That's, for me, iconic, literally iconic set in wrestling, wrestling history. And to the point where it's up, where, up there with some of the greatest WrestleMania entrance ways. Also, with that, if I fully admit, definitely use that fist on the entrance, make your own entrance on the WWE game so many times to the point where I made once where I had about eight or nine fists going around and making the old school um, raw like what's called entrance way with just loads of fists. I was like, yeah, I'm a big kid. I'm a big kid. Well, I was, I was still a big kid then, so yeah. Far too much time on your hands. I mean, it's great in 2K23 because you can now have the fist set on SmackDown, the proper one, with the side entrance plates. I remember when you watched, um, was it SmackDown Shut Your Mouth or SmackDown Here Comes the Pain? One of the two, and it was in there for the first time. And there was something, I don't know what it was about that set, but it's just something, whenever you watch it, you know, whenever you look it back on the WWF network, WWE network, and you look at the old classic SmackDowns and you see that set, there's just something about it. And the Beautiful People soundtrack as well. It's it's also it was something different. That's what was so great. But also that that debut sh- live show was it just it was something new. It was we had Raw and now we got SmackDown. It, it was just something new and fantastic. So yeah. yeah. Our last bit for this week, and you can see it on screen. Fred Opman, formerly known as Tugboat. Yeah. Uh, WCW on August the 18th, 1993, presented Clash of the Champions 24. The main event was Big Van Vader defeating the British Bulldog Davy Boy Smith to retain the WCW World Championship. But more famously, the Shockmaster made his debut in a backstage segment uh, seamlessly and graciously busting through a gimmick wall and uh, no mistakes were made. Yeah, right. Yeah. I love whenever you talk about famous wrestling bloopers, you or laugh out loud moments, that has to be the top of the list. Right? Oh, yeah. That's, when you that's see, up there with the Gobbledy Gooker. <laughs> yeah, but when you see the Shockmaster burst through, fall over, then scramble to try and grab that Stormtrooper helmet and put it back on again. And I mean, what was the costume designer smoking when they came up with that? I mean, it's just... It's just what well, wasn't he? <laughs> Yeah, like, I think it would have been funny anyway if it was another mask. But the fact that they just basically had bought a replica Stormtrooper mask that would have cost so much, covered it in PVA glue, dipped it in literally the every glitter on the earth, and gone, oh, do you know what? This could really work as the new helmet for a wrestler. I'm sorry, are you expecting to tell me that if he what if the mask didn't fall off and it wasn't a failed gimmick, he was going to wrestle in that helmet? I don't think so. Oh, that would like, be hilarious. But also, there has been speculation through the years, and I would happily join the speculation that that was a work. It was always planned to smash through and make a thing to make the history. So then everyone talks about their show talked about that moment they knew it was going to be a history making moment who 
in their right mind goes, oh, do you know what? Let's push him through a bloody wall. No, no, don't be so freaking stupid. Do you know what? I'm going to try and see if I can find the audio of the interview that I did with Tugboat, where I asked him about the Shockmaster. I'll see if I can find it. And if I can, I'll play it next week on the show. Um, I, it was just a brilliant segment. We should do that one week. We would do the top 10 most laugh out loud moments in professional wrestling. That would be a, uh, that would be a talking point. Um, all the funniest right, that... <laughs> The Miz. Uh, right. Whoa. That... Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. No, no, no. No, no one talks bad of my, 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 oh, The Miz. No, okay, no, no. The most laugh out loud gimmick of all time is Shayna Baszler thinking she's got talent. Right. Let's go. Um, <laughs> no, don't see that. Don't see that. He's the winner of. She is going to be the winner of the Royal Rumble next year for the women. Just I've saying. Two, I've only got two words to say for you. No boy. Uh, right. Let's go to talking point where we're going to be talking about the impact of one Paul Heyman. We'll see you in a sec. <laughs> All right, it's time for Talking Point. So this is actually not my project, not my planned segment. So I'm going to hand the reins over. I'm going really slow. Now I'm going really fast. It's like, oh, if you look at the, the screen on, on YouTube, Sky Fiber, I need to sort you out. I'm going to hand you over to Sam because this week we are talking all about the Heyman effect. Yeah, so as I've said before, and I'll say it again, Heyman's one of my favorite wrestling managers of all time. And I turned to uh, Andy and I said, why don't we do a bit about how much that Heyman has affected the WWE and wrestling landscape? My feeling is he has made such an impact. And I thought we could talk about this so easy. My first question to Andy is, I'm going to ask you, Andy, your favourite moment of Paul Heyman ever? ECW, what is an, ECW One Night Stand. Oh, I thought you were going to say, because it's exactly the same here. 2005. And I know it's the most obvious one to turn around and say, but there's two reasons why I've gone with that. One, that was Paul Heyman. That was like the closure of that Paul E. Dangerously character from ECW. Right? That was the chance for Paul to come out and go... I'm done. I've got my moment. And it took you back to ECW. It took you back to the passion that Heyman had and still has for the business and how much love and respect the fans had for Paul Heyman and for ECW. And how often can you turn around and say, you're the only reason that you wanted to work, your WWE champion is because Triple H didn't want to work Tuesdays. It, it, you know, that's the first time for me where I think you saw that blurred line between reality and storyline. And I think the second moment, because they're obviously quite equal, is just before Survivor Series of 2001, where he comes out and he cuts that promo on Vince McMahon. Yeah. And he said in the documentary about, I was just told to go out and cut a promo. Say what you want, do what you need, but draw me money. Yeah, and that is Paul Heyman. You can sum Paul Heyman up in three words draw me money because everything he touches goes to gold. Yeah, and I think the one another reason why I love that moment is the one that stand is the fact that it, 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 it's, it's up there with like history of wrestling that you can sit back and just watch and it's just pure gold it's pure money it's pure like it makes you want to watch more and more and you want to watch it again it ends it ends it's playing you just want to go and stop rewind go back to the start and watch it again because this man he i uh, loved when he was had the Heyman guys and he had it said on the front i'm a Heyman guy and on the back it said the voice of the voiceless mm-hmm. and like the thing for me is that you look back and who he's been affiliated with with stone Cold steve austin Rick Rude, Ryback, right in his time in, in, it hit, but listen to me out, 
his time when he was with Ryback, it was fantastic. The fact you had CM Punk, you had Curtis Axel, you had Cesaro. There were so many opportunities and times he was with people. With Brock Lesnar, with Paul White, the big show, with Roman Reigns. He has changed in moulded in time. And that being said, with the time that he has been linked with, let's say, for instance, your Roman Reigns, your Brock Lesnar, has there ever been a moment we thought to ourselves of, is there any better manager? And there isn't. For, for me, when we're watching him wrestle, it is truly, and I think I've, I say this, him and Bobby Heenan and Freddie Blassie, there's no one can beat them at their managerial roles. But the thing is, the thing with Heyman, he had the Heyman effect, is that he also knows how to be a good manager because he's been a great promoter. So... My question to you, another question to you, Andy, is, and I'll happily throw these questions to you because you quote throw the questions to me, Damn. is that during his time, the affiliation of the, all these different wrestlers, be it from when he was Paul Lee Dangerous to now as Paul Heyman, the wise man, the, the advocate, and for you, what was his best era, his best time, and who was his best association with? I think that's a really difficult question to answer because Paul Heyman is a bit like The Undertaker. He he changes and evolves as the time goes on based on his experience and, and where he and who he's with. So if you look back to WCW in nineteen ninety one, when he was part of the when he ran the Dangerous Alliance, that was the very early inclination of what Paul Heyman was going to become. That was a really rough and ready, you know, obnoxious character that was actually forward thinking. And he did some great work with guys like Ravishing Rick Rude, like Arn Anderson, like Bobby Eaton, who you wouldn't have expected to have fallen under the tutelage of, of Paul Heyman. He adapted. Then when you think about the ECW run, and it was poorly, dangerously that disappeared and it became Paul Heyman. Yeah. That I think is when you saw the beginning of greatness. But then you, you've got that and you've got those historic promos and you've got the Paul Heyman effect in ECW, turning it round, taking it from a grassroots indie promotion to pretty much the third brand in professional wrestling. And in some ways, one of the most respected brands to this day, because people still chant ECW and all elite are still pulling out the ECW originals. Yeah. But then he, he developed again when he went into the WWF. And, and I think that's really to, to bring it back. It's a, and I'm, and I'm waffling. It's a really difficult one to answer because you can't answer it. I think each iteration of Paul Heyman has brought something different and he's grown and he's developed to where he is now. The wise man character that he's playing with Roman Reigns is an embodiment of 30, 35 year career of Paul Heyman. And I can sum it up by the SummerSlam press conference when he yeah. came out and he went F the rules and he broke down the story. He broke down what's going to come next. And and that's Paul Heyman yeah. ahead of his time. And that uh, I throw this around and I fully admit, I've thrown around the saying bona fide Hall of Famer. So many oh, times without, without, a doubt. Wrestlers. without a doubt. But this man, if he is not the main event, main name of next year's Hall of Fame in Philadelphia, it is a crime. And I honest, truly believe he can still be on weekly showings, like you have your Ray Mysterio, like you have your Edge. He could still come out and be on weekly showings still as the Hall of Famer, Paul Heyman. And just imagine that acceptance speech. You think The Undertaker last uh, <laughs> last year was amazing. No, you ain't seen nothing yet when you've got that man with a microphone in his hand talking about his life. And also, who's going to who's gonna accept him into the Hall of Fame? Their stories are going to be amazing. So, yeah. You've got to think with the Hall of Fame, and this is a completely different conversation, but you've got to think with the Hall of Fame. There are certain individuals in the industry who don't need to have an undercard. No. Right? 
The Rock doesn't need to have an undercard of inductees. Stone Cold didn't need to have an undercard of inductees. Triple H didn't need to have an undercard. Shawn Michaels, to a degree, didn't need to have an undercard. The Undertaker. The argument is The Undertaker. He didn't need to have one either. Paul Heyman is one that I think would actually overshadow anybody else who go who went into his class. Whether or not it's the class of 24, who knows. But if it is, and it makes sense it being in, in Philadelphia, I would do the whole thing around Paul Heyman. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah, and I, and I wouldn't just have one person induct him. I would have Rob Van Dam come out. I would have Tommy Dreamer come out. I would have the Sandman yeah. come out. I would have Mick Foley come out. I would have almost Paul have it like this is your life. Basically, go back, yeah. I, go I would... back to the nineties and have a this is your life yeah. of Paul, like Paul Heyman. Yeah. Or a, another thing would be, what if? And I'm just going to put this spitball an idea. If you are going to have Paul Heyman as the one who's the main event, let's say. All the rest of the people who are being inducted next year should be extreme wrestlers, like you have your Tommy Dreamer, your people like that. They should be inducted that year. So it's almost like an ECW year. Yeah, but do you know but what, that, that's just me. You know what, yeah, but do you know what the ultimate fan dream would be? What's now, that? WWE would never do it because it will never give them the revenue. You induct Paul Heyman in the ECW arena. That's it. Money. Now, obviously, the capacity would be nowhere near what they would do if they did it in the reader like they do now with, you know, following SmackDown. But Paul Heyman, back home, ECW Arena, inducted by the ECW Originals. You could even bring back Joey Styles to host the evening. Oh, my God, yes. Instead of, like, Kayla Braxton or Renee Young or whatever, it could be Joey Styles coming back to, to host it. Now, that this is fantasy booking we are fantasy booking paul Heyman going into the hall of fame but i want to pick up on one point that you said and that is he could still come out weekly on tv as wwe hall of famer paul Heyman. personally i think that would ruin the paul Heyman character for me and, and there's two reasons for this no, interesting. I, I think the bloodline storyline is the culmination of paul Heyman's career Okay, he is everything we've talked about earlier on 35 plus years in professional wrestling, Brock Lesnar, Roman Reigns, Dangerous Alliance, ECW, everything is coming together in this. It's the pinnacle of storylines. And when it comes down to the end, he will go out as the manager of the longest reigning WWE champion in history. Yeah. Yeah. He will go out as being the architect of the biggest, longest story in recent memory. And actually, what is left for Paul Heyman to do? And that's the thing. There's my 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 thing is is where are they going with it as well? Because I see personally, no offense to Solo to cover, incredible in ring talent. But not overly amazing on the mic. So are they going to do it where he would be solo to covers like ring pit, um, what's called voice pieces, as that mm-hmm. saying goes? Is that where they're going? But then are they thinking, are they just elongating it? Is it, is it, is it oh, yes, another screw job like we had where it went, Paul Heyman was with um, Brock Lesnar, then he was with Roman Reigns. Oh, then he bounced back from to Brock Lesnar to then actually find out he was actually under Roman Reigns' reign. And we, everyone says the GOAT. He, is he the GOAT? Is he the GOAT this? Is he the GOAT that? He's one of the GOATs. He is, for me, not the GOAT, and I'm not poo-pooing on him. He is one of the best like, wrestling managers of all time, but he is one of, not the best. He is one of. But he is the best in his form, like the way he does stuff and in the form of if you look at Paul uh, uh, at Bobby Heenan, if Bobby Heenan was around these days, it's a completely different style than what Paul Heyman is doing. It's the same with Freddie Blassie. If he was around these days, it's completely different. Would it work the same in a day and age that not many wrestlers have managers, which is a crime. I'm a massive wrestling managers fan. It works with storylines and some of the storylines in WWE, AEW, 
impact all around the world need managers because some, some sometimes the wrestlers are the best in the ring, but they grab that 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 stick as old uh, CM Punk would say, and you'd rather than Mike to have a uh, power issue because you don't want to hear their voices. And that's no offence. And then it's the flip side. There are some people who are the best on the mic. Get them in that squared circle and, oh, my Lord, I'm going to turn off or I'm going to go off and get, make myself a coffee or I'm going to go and go use the uh, public toilets. Like, and it's the fact is that Heyman grips you. That's the thing. And he is a proof that he is one of the best. He is one of the goats because of that, that situation. And that's why the Paul Heyman effect works so well because it grips you in and you want to hear everything he has to say the thing about Heyman is he is the all-round total package right he doesn't have to be a manager he could be a commentator which he's done yeah. and he was great on the mic but he can also come out I think and grab you by the heartstrings and we saw that in the road to Wrestlemania this year especially that promo with Cody Rhodes on Monday Night Raw which everybody is still talking about to this day because it was absolute gold you know he came out he did the heartfelt strings of being one of dusty's kids and growing up with dusty and working with dusty in wcw and then just like that he turned it round and ripped the heart out of cody rhodes and said roman reigns is his son that's the ability of paul Heyman to control a narrative and control a story to create the story to build the story um and say, to hell with the rest of you, we're doing it my way. Now, to take the Bloodline storyline, no, he shouldn't carry on. Once it's done, that's it. He shouldn't go to Solo Sokoa. I was a bit concerned earlier this last month that he was going to go with uh, Jey Uso. Yeah. Um, I'm glad they didn't. I think the Bloodline is, is one and done. You know, he says we're at the bottom two thirds of the innings. We're not. I think we're pretty much at the end of the, the bloodline run now. I think it will culminate at WrestleMania 40. Um, but his impact in professional wrestling is, is second to none. I would argue you saying he is the greatest manager of all time. And, and yeah. I don't mean no disrespect to Bobby Heenan because I am a huge Bobby Heenan fan. I always have been. But if you look at him, he is here and Bobby Heenan is literally a hair's whisper. And I don't think in this day and age, if Bobby Heenan was still around, active, he would actually hold a candle to Paul Heyman. No, well, I understand that. I, I, I really fully respect that. And that's the joys of uh, being yeah. a wrestling fan. We're all open to different opinions. It, but absolutely. That's and, and no one's opinion is, is the right answer. But the thing is, we yeah. no, no, no. But the thing is, all we do know is that the fact that I, I, I was using a little, like a little thing that I remember back with college when I did performing arts. We were always taught about saying a speech and how you want to have it. Do you want to be have it where you'll have your audience all sat almost like on the voice? We have those chairs that turn around. But you have everyone facing away from you. Mm -hmm. Within the first minute of any speech you should grab them and you should be able to have every single one of those seats turn around and be focused on you paul Heyman and his effect does one thing better he grabs you within the first seven seconds and there's a thing in psychology that in the first seven seconds of meeting someone that you've never met before you make your first and your full judgment on them it may not be the right judgment and they might change your mind but they grab you. And that's what Paul Heyman does. In that first seven seconds of hearing any promo, you're gripped. You're like, what are you saying? Or even the fact on social media, you're scrolling through Instagram, you're scrolling through X, you're on Facebook groups. Anything of Paul Heyman, people stop, they read, they watch, they like. They, the viewing ratings of anything Paul Heyman on WWE YouTube is super high. Even if it's him just absolutely ripping a new one into Kayla Braxton on Talking Smack, or if he's actually ripping a new one into Brian's, um, Brian's, Brian Staxton on um, the, the Raw one. It's just, that's the thing. He grabs anyone, and he grabs anyone by the cojones, but he does, and I truly believe there's not one wrestler who could have him as the manager and not be a main, not so much a main eventer, but be in a storyline. Because if it's not the wrestling or not the speaking, he is 
guiding each and every one of them. That's why when I said about Ryback, yeah, he ain't the greatest. However, when he, they were affiliated with each other, it worked. You look at um, Michael McGillicuddy then became Curtis Axel. That worked because it was with Paul Heyman. See, I, I, look- I'm going to argue that, though, because and the reason I'm going to argue it is no disrespect to yourself, but I don't remember that. Now, I remember Punk. I remember Cesaro. I remember Lesnar. I remember Roman Reigns. I even remember back in the OVW day, some of the guys he had down there. But I can't remember Ryback or Curtis Axel, right? I know it happened, but I can't remember yeah. it. No, so fair. I think that I think the, the overall perception that a lot of wrestling fans have is that, yes, you've got this Heyman effect and he's a Midas touch. And when you touch something, he turns everything gold. He doesn't. He's had some some faders. Doesn't. Now, part of that can be, yeah, Rybacks. Part of that can be WWE booking or the actual storylines that he's got coming in. But I think with Heyman, he will try and turn a turd into a polished turd. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I get, no, I get yeah. And and he will try and do that. He can't always. And I think yeah. you you also see that frustration in him. Yeah. And you saw that frustration in him towards the end of 2004 when he was leaving the WWF and he took some time away and then he came back. You saw that frustration in Heyman when they brought ECW back. Never talk about that again. You yeah. saw that frustration in him when he was on commentary. You saw that frustration in him in terms of of various different things that he's done, right? But you also look in recent memory at some of the most pivotal moments in our industry. You look at the Undertaker streak being broken, right? You talk about Brock Lesnar. Who was with him? Yeah. You You talk about the longest reigning WWE champion. Who was with him? Also, you look back. Also, we're talking about long reigns. CM Punk, when they were work- they were working together, yeah. that was when CM Punk did his massive long reign. But also, with link to CM Punk, one of my favourite storylines or stuff like that with Heyman in the recent years. I say recent years, about ten or so years ago, WrestleMania twenty nine, CM Punk versus The Undertaker, like. In New York, when it was um, NYNJ, I think or I think that's what it was. Yeah. WrestleMania yeah. NYNJ, and the storyline leading up to that, when they were doing the whole Heyman uh, of um, what's it called uh, uh, Paul um, Paul Bearer and stuff like that, it was pure brilliant. And the fact of, I'm not saying CM Punk wouldn't have been able to do that storyline leading into that match and not be amazing, but the fact of Heyman being linked to that made it that little bit more special and made it just that it, it, it it's almost like having a perfect cake and going oh we're just gonna add a bit of sprinkles on top superb i talk about food too much but he yeah is, but he, as i said earlier Heyman's the midas touch yeah you give him something and he'll turn it to gold well it's and- like stone Cold steve austin always says that if it wasn't for Heyman, some of his in-ring mic work wouldn't be what it is because they sat down and chatted so many times about but- it but that's but that's another aspect of Paul Heyman that nobody really appreciates. When you look at him in creative, that mind, he's always constantly thinking of stories and way to go. And whereas you think, I mean, you know, you and I have taught booking and, and creative before. You could be booking for January. He's booking for January 2024. Yeah. He's that far ahead. That's his mind. That's that creative psychological psycho genius that that he is right but he's an he's an encyclopedia you could ask paul Heyman anything and he does it and what happens to paul Heyman at the end i don't know i think there's part of me that thinks the industry would be absolutely at a loss if you lost that impact of paul Heyman, if you lost him being involved in the backstage capacity but there's another part of me this really selfish part of me that wants Paul Heyman to be given an unlimited amount of funds and told to go out and do it again. Do you know what I'd love to see him? I, 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 it, uh, it, uh, maybe it's a hope and joy of it all. 
NXT Europe. Oh. Just imagine if he was given the power behind that. End storyline with Bloodline. Perfect time around WrestleMania next year because they're saying that NXT Europe could be starting next summertime. Just imagine if whoever they're in charge of WWE is. We'll talk about that, I'm sure, in news round next week when we're having more stories come out about it this week. But we will sit there and we will think to ourselves how beautiful and how golden that promotion would be if that man had his Midas touch, as we call it, touch that promotion and touch that form. Oh, it would be it would be perfect. In, in closing this bit and in closing the show, because we're coming to the end, we replace the term the Midas touch with quite simply what we've called this section, the Heyman effect. effect yeah. And that is it. It's the Heyman effect on professional wrestling. Whatever he touches goes to gold. Heyman's legacy in this business is never going to be matched. It's unparalleled. He is no. up there with Vince McMahon. McMahon is a great yeah, whether or not you like McMahon or whether you hate McMahon, I couldn't care because he's up there. Without Vince, we wouldn't have All Elite. Without Vince, we wouldn't have Impact. Without Vince, we wouldn't have New Japan. Without Vince, we wouldn't have the biggest wrestling event happening in a week's time at All In. But we also wouldn't have it if it wasn't for Heyman. Exactly. And they're, they're a tandem. They're going... You could argue the same about Eric Bischoff to a lesser degree. But... With a, it all started with Vince. And Heyman is the same. Heyman has got the mind. He's done it. He's taken a grassroots promotion that should never have been at national level and got it onto national TV. It should never have been international. He got it international. He should never have been on pay-per-view. He got it on pay-per-view. It should not be talked about almost 30 years after it launched. Yeah. Absolutely. And it shouldn't be. ECW shouldn't no. still be talked about, but it is. And you shouldn't have had in 2005 one of the best pay per views of all time that didn't feature WWE performers. It featured, yes, under contract to WWE, but it featured ECW originals. And that was Heyman. That yeah, absolutely. is the Heyman effect. Yeah, absolutely. Bloody lootly. <laughs> there we go. What better way to finish? the show than talking about the legend that is Paul Heyman. Uh, thanks, Sam, for coming up with that idea. Now, if you want to get in contact and let us know what you think about Paul Heyman, do you agree with the comments? Do you agree with the Heyman effect? Then you can do using the hashtag TSC pod across all the social media at TSC wrestling pod. Now, don't forget as well that you can subscribe on all the main podcast platforms we've given you a selection here spotify apple and google by searching the squared circle and look for the squared circle podcast logo in the top left hand corner um subscribe like leave us a review it really does help us and on youtube like sam said earlier on click subscribe and hit the bell then you get told about the latest releases as they come now Whew, here we go here we go Oh, I've taken it all off. Next Sunday, all in. We're meeting up August the 27th at Wembley Stadium. We've talked about it all the way through the show. But more than that, ooh, wrong background. But more than that, I'm really making a mistake on here. It's because I'm trying to wrap up the show. But more than that, Sam, you were going to pitch it next week. Do it now. What are we bringing to the masses next week right here on the Squared Circle? So, me... Sam Mellows, Andy Evans. We are going to be going on the road all the way to Wembley to all in AEW. And when we're there, and also on our journey there and back, we're going to record ourselves. We're going to do a little vlog. It's going to be a new segment that's going to come up on our YouTube channel. It's going to be a YouTube exclusive. And it's going to be called TSC Road Agents. Whenever we go to live wrestling shows and we have opportunity to talk to wrestlers, talk to fans, we're going to be on our on the road and we're going to take our camera with us. We're going to film interviews and talking points. When we're in, we're going to leave reviews straight away there and then. But we're going to be the road agents. But why? Because we are on the road and we're agents. But no, seriously, when we're there, we'd love you to feature on said episodes. 
So if you see us on the road, if you see us at the fleet service stations, because it's a it's part of the programs pilgrimage to London, you have to stop at fleet service stations. Little plug to fleet service stations. Um, but honestly, if like it's for us, it's going to be a great new uh, segment. It's only going to be YouTube exclusive. But the great thing is we can you can see how our journey goes there and back and also during our time there but also when in future shows we're going to be doing other shows so be it going to a show nearby at rev pro or be it we go up the country to watch impact we're going to be on the road and you'll be able to follow us our journey along with us hopefully we'll interview a few wrestlers along the way and hopefully also some of you fans so please meet up with us on the 27th because we'd love you to feature on it so yeah, uh, that is Road Agents. We will have more information about it next week. And then after we have the show, we'll put it all together and we'll release it our first episode. For the first episode, it will be AEW All In at Wembley Stadium on the 27th. So yeah, please join us uh, with uh, TSC Road Agents. I love you how he says we'll put it all together. It won't be we'll put it all together. It'll be I'll put it all together. You never um, know. I, I might put it together. Who knows? <laughs> We want to be able to watch it. I'll put it all together. Ooh, it. Yeah. So it, it's all good. I mean, it's also going to be interesting to see how bad I look on the way back because uh, of driving back from uh, Wembley Stadium at God knows what time it's going to be in the morning. Be fine. And I guarantee you that when we get to Fleet, you'll be seeing a flood of AEW t-shirts uh, and all the things. So we'll know who to catch. That's Road Agents next week. Now, also uh, next week, we are going to be previewing All In. Uh, did you know it's happening next Sunday? Uh, we're going to be previewing that show next week on the card in the event center. We're going to also hopefully have a guest. Uh, that guest is my longtime close personal friend and Sam's uh, the godfather of UK wrestling podcast. Uh, Lee Tyers will be joining us. Uh, the original creator of the squared circle. So the guy who uh, him and I worked very closely together on this and the original uh, Ministry of Slam back in the day. So Lee's going to be joining us next week for the All In preview. Uh, hopefully going to be speaking to him as part of Road Agents as well. Uh, and we've got all your news, got everything else. That's next week. But until then, Sam, any last words? Yeah, um, I'm just going to... Uh, my last little thing is thank you, everyone, for joining us on today's episode. I also want to give a massive shout-out to Travis. Uh, Travis is the guy who interviewed me for Southwestern Railway, and he's a massive wrestling fan. And he's one of our new subscribers. And I want to say a big thank you. Because uh, also, I've got the job. Um, so I will be starting on South Western Railway soon. Um, but that does not affect me doing this show. Well, I'm still going to love doing this show. But yeah, mess- massive shout out to Travis. Because tail end of my interview, I should have started with it anyway. The tail end of my interview, I talked about wrestling. And he marked out and he started singing Cody Rhodes theme tune. So that was awesome. So yeah, big shout out to Travis. Thank you for my interview. But no, also, thank you all you fans who listen every single week. We love you. Please get involved because we love hearing from you. And hopefully we will see you at the matches, especially at All In. <laughs> You've stolen my catchphrase. How you can you... use it again because it's the best, literally one of the best catchphrases ever. I love it. I love it. I literally love that saying. I almost got it into the interview last night, but I forgot. Um, oh, no. I know. I know. <laughs> uh, one final plug. If you want to listen to Diana Perazzo or watch Diana, you can do on YouTube and on the podcast feed. Big thanks to Impact Wrestling. Don't forget, buy your tickets for the Impact Wrestling UK Invasion Tour taking place in October uh, on the 26th, 27th, 28th, and 29th. Impactwrestling.com forward slash events. Buy your tickets today. Uh, we will see you next week. Sam, congratulations on the job. That's great news. And uh, until then, we might see you at ringside. Ah, we'll see you soon. Take care, everybody. See you next week. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>